So tonight, uh, I wanted to begin by sharing that, as many of you know, we just got back from one of our retreats. It was our spring retreat. And one of the experiences I have as, you know, bearing witness to people moving through retreats is I see folks at the beginning and they come in uh, road-weary and bedraggled and we, we have our first interviews on on groups that meet and share on Saturdays and you can just feel the stress of life and the anxiety and the, the self-criticism that's, you know, kind of uh, really entangling minds and hearts. At the end, I look around and I see, you know, all these different bodies and faces but this same kind of shine coming through and it's got the spirit of a confidence or a faith that has been deepened or strengthened. And it's really beautiful because what people find is that through the retreat, it wasn't all pleasant, it was a mix, but that through that time, by being present, they discovered they could handle the ups and downs. One student put it this way, from a past retreat, uh, told a different teacher that uh, after a real roller coaster, she said that the uh, real gift, the real learning, the real freedom is in getting real. That we just are real with ourselves. So I was reflecting on this because one of the great gifts of the path is this confidence. Um, perhaps more than what we might think of as happiness, this faith, this confidence that we can handle life gives us a freedom in the moment that we're not tensing against what's around the corner. And the Buddha described faith as really the beginning of all good things. It's the first of the spiritual faculties that he described that both awakens us and, and energizes us and also expresses our wisdom. Now, we all have some faith. I mean, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have some sense of um, possibility, some intuitive sense of something possible, some growth, some unfolding that was possible. You wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be listening if you're one of the people listening, if you didn't have some faith in that. When that faith is full-blown, the Tibetans have a name for it, and it's called the lion's roar. The lion's roar. And I love that, I love the term. And I'll read you a little bit, uh, Tibetan teacher Chogyam Trungpa uh, has written a lot about it. He's the, where I first heard the term. Here's what he says. He says, the Buddha speaks of the lion's roar. The lion's roar is the fearless proclamation that anything that happens in our state of mind, including emotions, is manure. Okay, you know, manure for Bodhi, you know, it's the grounds of waking up. Anything that happens, he said, whatever comes up is a workable situation. It's a workable situation. It's a reminder of practice. It's a way to proceed further into this path of practice. You might imagine for a moment what it would be like if you truly discerned that whatever came up in your life was workable. You know, anything. It's workable. So this is what I'd like to talk about tonight and also next week, is this sense that uh, the lion's roar, this possibility of really trusting this life, trusting our beings. I'd like to talk about how we cultivate that and, and the blessings, the gifts that that gives us. And I like to begin by looking at, because this is very interesting, what is it we want to have faith in? And I'm going to use the words faith and, and trust. Uh, you know, I'm going to kind of swing back and forth between them. And one of the things that we wish we could have faith in 
is that there's going to be a happy ending to everything. When we say it works out, everything's workable, that means it's workable like, I'm doing okay, I'm not going to get sick, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to lose relationships. You know, life's workable. We want it to have happy endings. There's a little story of a father on the beach with his uh, children and the four-year-old runs up to him and grabs his hand. He leads him to a seagull who's lying dead in the sand. Daddy, what happened to him? Son asked. Well, he died and he went to heaven. Did God throw him back down? <laughs> so you get the idea. <laughs> so we want it to work out, that's our idea. We want it to go our way. Another thing that we, you know, wish we could have faith in is related. And that's that in some way this, that it's predictable, that we're gonna, we can anticipate what's going to happen, we can plan for it, we can deal with it because, you know, it follows certain, certain kind of understanding we have about how way, the way things should be, right? So it's not out of control. So this story for you. An atheist was out fishing one day when the Loch Ness monster suddenly attacked his boat. <laughs> Things like that happen, you know. <laughs> so it flipped the boat into the air and opened its mouth to swallow the man and the boat. The man cried out, God, help me! And at once the scene froze in place with the atheist hanging in midair and a voice came booming through the clouds, I thought you didn't believe in me. <laughs> at which the guy said, give me a break, I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster either. <laughs> Okay, so we want things to work out our way. We certainly want them to be predictable, controllable, manageable. And we really want to have faith or trust ourselves. But can we? I mean, I remember for myself, and it was like one of those aha moments uh, in my early 20s when I realized completely there's no way I can trust this self. This ego self is guaranteed to, uh, I hurt myself, with, I make myself promises, I'm going to not eat too much today, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, break them all the time, I couldn't trust myself. I'd hurt other people, be competitive, be selfish, how could I trust this self? Can we? You know, these selves get depressed, they get anxious, they don't do what we tell them to do. So that one's kind of X'd off. I'm just Xing off what we can't trust, what we can't have faith in. Of course, trusting others. Can we trust others? Can we? We certainly can't trust that others aren't going to hurt us. We can't trust that they'll cooperate with the way we want them to act. Anyway, so we're going to cross that off too for now. We can't trust humans. I mean, collectively, what's happening? Humans are threatening every other species on planet Earth. Can't trust humans. Things might not work out for the Earth, so we can't trust that. We also see the destructiveness of misguided faith. I mean, how many of us have read stories about these wild-eyed people that are convinced that um, their mission is X, Y, and Z, which includes destroying other people, right? That's misguided faith. So we can't trust that uh, faith doesn't get really narrow and, and fear-driven. Yet there's something in us that still intuits that having faith in what is healing and true, what our heart senses as true, will energize and support our path. So that's there too. So let's explore a little more and sense, well, what can we trust? I mean, if you ask yourself that right now, what can you have faith in? What can you trust? And if you said it just in a few words, and I'm going to open it right now and just ask for a few people to just say what comes to mind. What can you really trust? Anyone? The heart? Yeah. The heart? Your dog? 
What can you trust about your dog? You can trust that your dog has faith in you, okay? What else? Speak loudly. I'm sorry? You can trust that the sun comes in the morning, okay? What else? What do you trust that matters to you? What can you trust that really matters to you? Yeah? That there's a benevolence underneath all that happens in my life. That underneath all that happens in my life there's a benevolence. Thank you. What else? Yeah? Somehow or other, no matter what happens, it will be all right, including dying and including losing other people. So there's some basic sense that it's okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? By the way, there's no wrong answers. We're just trying to sense what's in the room here. Yeah. No matter what happens, I'm going to keep breathing. But what about when you die? Up until then. (laughs) Up until that point, you'll... You won't need to trust in something outside yourself, you mean? The illusion of being a human will... will be gone, okay. Okay? Yeah. In the back there? You can trust that the part of you that exists, your personality, what about it? Uh, beneath the personality. So now we've had a few people that have said things that point to that, that there's, we, there's personality and conditioning. We know we can't trust that that personality and conditioning will operate as we wish it would. But there's something we're sensing underneath that that is there, that's benevolent, that's heart, that somebody mentioned. Somebody raised their hand, Phyllis? that everything's always changing, so on all the levels everything's always changing and there's something benevolent. Now, here's a way that I think might be useful for us to think about it. That we can trust in the possibility of awakening. That we can trust in our potential to be loving and awake. That there's a benevolence, a goodness that's always here and we can trust that it can become more and more expressed and lived. How many of you, as you hear that, I'm going to say it once more, how many of you find that resonates? That we can trust our potential to be loving and awake. How many like that one? We can trust our potential. So that says that there's something intrinsic some intrinsic awakeness and love, goodness that's there that we might not be in touch with a lot of the time. In fact, we might be really caught up in those surface waves if we have the ocean wave metaphor. But there is an oceanness, a vastness, something timeless, something beautiful that can wake up through us. That's possible. That was the message of the Buddha. And that's the message when we look really at any contemplative or mystical path, that this is our potential. And again, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have some faith in that, some faith in that possibility. Now in Buddhism, they describe the cultivation of this faith as going through three stages that I think are interesting. And the first stage is sometimes called blind faith and it's, it's kind of just a young faith, it's an early faith. And in that faith something inspires us, it might be listening to talks, it might be reading something, it might be that you were with the Dalai Lama at some gathering and just sensed the purity of his goodness. Something inspires us about that possibility. And we get energized, we want to practice meditation, we want to gather with like-minded people, that's the beginning. We sense, we get that glimmer, ah, there's something I want to realize and live from. The second phase is called verified faith. 
verified faith is what you'd imagine, we start practicing presence and we touch into some truths. We start realizing, oh, that love and awakeness really is here. And then our faith starts really lighting up. It's like, oh, that's more who I am than that personality. Is this all making sense right now? This unfolding? The final phase of faith is called unshakable faith. And that emerges when realization is very deeply integrated and steady and strong. That we really know and trust who we are. Sometimes called Buddha nature or, you know, God consciousness. We trust that awareness, that loving presence as our nature. It doesn't mean there's still not surface waves, it just means our identity, it's not sticky. We don't get hitched. So that's the unfolding, that's somewhat described as the uh, path of realization. And one of the first questions that then comes up for us is, well, what is right now in my life between me and really trusting, really trusting in this Uh, Buddha nature and this awareness and this love. What... you, you might even just sense that right now, just let that question drop in. It's an important one. So what is between me and trusting life? trusting it's really okay, trusting who's here, the deep being that's here. What's between me and really loving life without holding back? You can keep on checking in, but for many people as we investigate this this question, what, what we get is fear, that there's some fear that, well, we're saying that everything's okay, but it just doesn't feel okay. It's like in here it feels shaky, it feels like around the corner something bad is going to happen, which is, of course, our survival nervous system, the way it's been conditioned over the eons. So in a way, faith is challenging because our existential perception is, well, there's a separate self in here that needs to defend and protect itself. And on one level, that's the truth. On one level, that's the truth. So, we have a body-mind with a nervous system that is inclined to mistrust in order to survive. Now, if we grow up in a family or in a culture where there's a natural way to belong. And the word belonging is going to be really key in this exploration together. If we have a natural way to belong to our tribe, to our earth, okay, there's a belonging, we feel a part of something larger, then that existential sense of separation, the fear, does not possess and define us. Rather, that sense of belonging becomes more and more what we rest in. But most of us did not grow up in that kind of uh, milieu. Our environment uh, gave us mixed messages. There was love, there was some belonging, but for many, uh, more of a sense of having to uh, jump through hoops in order to be okay. And the more severed belonging, and by severed belonging, the more there really wasn't a sense of being part of. The more we felt separate, the more we felt either rejected or neglected or abused, the more we're part of a, a group in this, that the society marginalizes through racism, through sexism. The more that we felt severed belonging, the more mistrust, okay? Because we're feeling more separate, the more we have to pull up the fight-flight to make it. So it gets exacerbated by our families, by our societies. And then what happens is everything we do to try to protect ourselves from the pain of feeling separate makes us feel more separate. We get caught in a catch-22. 
we try all these strategies to feel better and they actually make us feel more separate. And I'll give you some examples. Like one of them that's really obvious, one of our main strategies, when we feel severed belonging, when we feel rejected, when we feel not a part, we get aggressive. It's like, okay, I'm a part, I'm going to oppress or put down or judge in some way someone else to inflate ourselves, to feel better. And of course, Um, we further identify with the insecure self that needs to react. So the more in our history that we felt rejected, the more we're going to mistrust that anyone could ever accept us. A wife comes home late at night and quietly opens the door to her bedroom. From under the blanket she sees four legs instead of two. She reaches for a baseball bat and starts hitting the blanket as hard as she can. (laughs) Once she's done, she goes to the kitchen to have a drink. As she enters, she sees her husband there reading a magazine. Hi, darling, he says. Your parents have come to visit us, so so I let them stay in our bedroom. Did you say hello? (laughs) It's pretty bad, I know. (laughs) Pretty bad. Anyway, but you get the idea. When we act out of our insecurity, how do we feel about ourselves? More insecure, right? So this is the catch-22. The second major strategy when we're feeling, when we come from a a background of severed belonging, is that we, to soothe it, we do anything we can to prove ourselves. I mean, we spend a lot of time, and you can look at today and look at yesterday, and how much of our day is in some way we're trying to prove to ourselves or others our worth. How much of each interaction are we in some way wanting another to approve of us? In one book I read, uh, there was some statistic about people that were working on their computer and when their computer said, good job, you did a good job, and they were actually wired to some sort of a machine. The part of the brain lit up that lights up when we win a huge amount of money or (laughs) it's a reward system. Just hearing a computer say, you did a good job. (laughs) But again, this is severed belonging, something's wrong, needing that kind of a feedback. So a lot of us have imposter syndrome because we do a lot to feel better about ourselves and it's coming from a place of something's not okay here. So we move through the world in some way feeling like people aren't getting it. They've, they've, they've bought our presentation. They don't know who's under. Now this is sweepingly pervasive, imposter syndrome. I read one statistic. They did a research uh, study just looking at asking psychologists how many psychologists experience it. Seventy percent of psychologists experienced imposter syndrome. Paul Newman said, I always have this feeling that someone is going to push through the crowd, grab my arm and say, it's over, Newman. It's all been a mistake, you know. (laughs) So we have this pressure to present a good self. And then we we doubt who's underneath. And even when You know, we sometimes, in a workshop, we'll do these sharings, we'll say, um, think of a good deed you did, some kindness, some random act of kindness, and share it, and we'll share in a group. Afterwards, this is what gets me, afterwards people come up and say, well, what that exercise showed me was how much any nice thing I've ever done, on some level, I feel like, well, it was self-serving. You know, it came out of guilt, or in some way I was trying to feel better about myself. Or, you know, they doubt their sincerity. So, the reason I'm sharing it with this with you is that the sense of doubt can be very deep. Doubt in okayness. And if we don't feel we're okay, we're not going to feel like everything's okay, because we are life. It's not like there's a life out there separate. If we don't trust ourselves, we're not going to trust others. And when I say again, trust ourselves, I don't mean our ego self. If we don't trust that benevolence, 
if we don't trust that potential to be awake and loving, we're not going to see it in others.